Einen schönen guten Tag. Ich freue mich, mich Sie alle. I'm happy to welcome you all near and far on behalf of the Heinrich Böck Foundation for the third part of the Decolonial Dialogues. Diese Veranstaltung ist digital und mehr is digital and multilingual, which means that there will be a translation into German, English and French respectively. So please use the globe button at the at the bottom of your screen. We hope there are many. There's translation to German, English and French. Please press the little globe button on the bottom of your screen for interpretation. Seit 1998, an international agreement has regulated how to deal with looted art from the National Socialist era. Looted art from the colonial era has rarely been discussed, although African states reclaimed many objects as early as the 1970s. But this is slowly changing. The first restitutions have been recorded. Many museums in Europe are now taking a self-critical look at their colonial form and are searching for a post-colonial identity. With today's event, Narratives of Objects, we start with these new dynamics and look at the potentials associated with the recovery of cultural heritage. For us, the objects are in quotation marks, since what, it, what is art or even an everyday object for Western eyes usually have another meaning for the dispossessed societies. It is essential that we also raise the question of power in this debate. Thus, at the opening of the Humboldt Forum last year, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie demanded, and I quote, who tells the story? Who is the narrator? And who is being narrated by? Who has decided that African art is classified as ethnological? Who has the right to exhibit the other? With our guests, we want to discuss how a different relational ethic between Africa and Europe can emerge from object-based dialogues. A relationship that understands the transfer of property rights of the objects to the societies of origin, not as the end, but as the beginning of a cultural culture of cooperation. Today, we will hear some interesting perspectives and voices on what such a beginning might look like. In addition to voices from Germany, which have been dealing with the practical decolonialization of museums for years, we are also pleased to have renowned artists from Senegal and Kenya with us. At this point, we would also like to thank our curator or team of curators um, of the Decolonial Dialogues, Philmont Gemay and Thomas Fuest, and especially also Marit Ifioma Kupka, who has been working on these very issues for years and will also be speaking here today. We're also pleased that Aisha Kamara will guide us through this event as usual. I hereby hand over and wish you a lot of space for new food for thought. Aisha, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third edition of Decolonial Dialogues. I feel very honored to be hosting today's session, uh, which is the third session we have in the series. And um, as Maria already mentioned, an important focal point of dealing with colonial heritage are the many, many countless objects from colonial contexts context that are being held and also displayed in European museums. What exactly does this mean for us today? How can a different relation emerge from the object-related dialogues? And how, what is needed to establish a so-called new culture of cooperation? Today, we want to get into the dialogue about this. The curators have again in invited speakers with various expertises and perspectives. So first off, we will hear four different inputs and we will then proceed to a discussion. And as usual, Maria already explained how it works. You can ask questions with the Q&A tool and also make commentaries in the chat section. So let me introduce today's first participant. It's Dr. Jan Legal. 
He's a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute for Art Studies at TU Berlin. He is part of a research project called the Restitution of Knowledge. This project investigates the enduring presence of colonial spoils of war from the so-called punitive expeditions in European museums. We, he has also been a member of Berlin Postcolonial since 2014. And as a member of the initiative Postcolonial Potsdam, he co-developed co an audio guide on traces of colonial history in Potsdam, a city where he also leads guided tours. We are really excited to have you today. The floor is yours, Dr. Jan Legal. Welcome. Thank you, Aisha. Um, I didn't know I was the first speaker, but that is uh, okay. Um, I will share my screen uh, right away, and I want to, yeah, to thank the the Heinrich Böll Stiftung and the um, and Marit Kuka and Aisha Kamara for the organization. It's been uh, great, and uh, you're you're a really good team. Um, so I hope that everyone can see this presentation. My talk is called needles of agency in haystacks of violence museum archives and collections as evidence of anti-colonial resistance with a question mark um but first before diving into this talk um i just want to say because this series is called decolonial dialogues that uh, i want to underline that my position and my upbringing as a white french cis man uh, influenced by eurocentric curriculum uh, means that I can never pretend to be able to decolonize anything, uh, except perhaps the colonial racist thinking that uh, has lingered in my mind. So I would therefore never describe myself as a decolonial scholar, uh, even though decolonial thought has influenced me along the years. And uh, as you said, as I'm a member of the Initiatives Berlin and Potsdam Postcolonial, and we have long been involved in the work of identifying, contextualizing, and deconstructing colonial traces in the city um, or in archives. We advocate for fallism and structural changes in traditionally white institutions, such as museums, but not only. Um, but our work belongs rather to the work of postcolonial critique or critical whiteness studies, and not uh, it does not belong to decolonial thought. Um, now coming to, back to the talk, um, this talk is rather linked to our research project at TU Berlin, a project that is uh, led in partnership with the University of Oxford. The talk deals with excavating museum archives and storerooms and to what extent this work can help us better understand the history of colonial violence. And by extension, um, we ask the question whether it can uh, give, give us some insight in uh, understanding anti-colonial resistance. Those spaces and those, those archives might indeed also contain stories of resistance to plunder, even if those stories are marginal. Um, I want to first acknowledge the fact that I will talk about some contexts that are uh, violent, and I want to issue this trigger warning first. Um, racist language and quotations have been replaced by uh, more neutral terms so that I, I don't hurt the viewers with sensibilities. Uh, if you want the original quotes, um, you can always send me an email and I can send it to you. So our work at TU investigates the history of so-called punitive expeditions and African artworks and belongings that were plundered during these expeditions. What is entirely, entirely lacking among museum studies is actually an overview of these violent events. And here's one way of presenting this overview. Um, an overview that reveals how the appropriation of cultural heritage took place during and alongside violent campaigns of subjugation, of extermination, and campaigns of coercion as well. So we started skimming archives of the German colonial military uh, with my colleagues, Jeanne-Ange Boigne and Elias Agiga. And we drew a list of military expeditions. Uh, we identified more than 210 campaigns that were labeled by the colonialists as punitive actions. I will always put that in quotation mark because this is a view from the colonial archive, from the colonialists um, who thinks that he has the right to punish um, African uh, communities. This um, 
this overview of the expedition actually excludes the two landmarks of African resistance in German colonial context, namely the Maji Maji War and the genocide of the Ovahero and Nama, um, which were not labeled as punitive actions, but uh, rather as war or as um, rebellions. Um, then the second type of archives that we deal with are museum archives connected to this history. Um, there. So museum archives means their collections, but also acquisition registries, databases, correspondences, etc. And browsing through such documents, we found out that between 1884 and 1915, officers of the German colonial military sent no less than 282 shipments to the Berlin Ethnological Museum, which was at the time um, thought as the central repository for those collections. Well, this is well known uh, in Germany. Lots of people know that these shipments arrived there, um, but it still reveals how connected the realm of colonial conquest and the realm of anthropology were at the time. There are so many letters, and I was at the Linden Museum today browsing through letters of offices. There are so many letters of, of colonial officers that are in museum archives telling about the history of this colonial violence. And the evidence of brutal events, such as the Benin expedition of 1897, which uh, I think everyone knows now um, today, fortunately, or the plunder of the Palace of Tibati in 1898 in Cameroon, which is a bit less known. Those, those two landmarks, for example, are quite rep widely represented in these lists and these acquisition registries. But there are also many other contexts that have largely been ignored by colonial historiography and we want to take all those contexts into consideration and identify patterns of colonial plunder. One of this pattern is um, departing from the reports, from the military uh, reports uh, to arrive at the museum. So this is one example. The task at hand is to find out which expeditions in our list of 210 expeditions are featured directly in museum collections or when do they arrive or what, when if objects were plundered, when do they arrive? Um, and how can we link um, the report and the collection? For this, we map the routes of officers and their platoons as well as the timeline. And then we try to find out whether they sent um, shipments after they attacked or burned down African towns or villages that are then mentioned, perhaps mentioned in museum archives. Um, the officers often relate how they burned down those villages or deprived Africans from their means of subsistence, such as land and cattle, but they seldom mention whether they robbed them from their cultural heritage and belongings. Here's an example with um, an officer called Gideon von Gravert, who launched an expedition to the region south of Lake Rueru in um, East Africa, today uh, in Rwanda in March, April, April, 1898. He aimed to bring local leaders to submit to German colonial rules, re leaders that um, actually did thought that they were sovereign nations. And at some point he lacked some barter material for diplomatic talks and he was ignorant of local politics. So um, seeing the Wanya Rwanda communities uh, unwilling to provide them with supplies because they didn't have gifts to the Germans didn't have gifts to to give them uh, for their for their hospitality. Um, instead of leaving them at peace, then Gravert used this kind of hostile behavior as a pretext to attack them and burn down their villages. And I quote him in English. So you've got the quote in German um, on the presentation. Quote, added to the long ignorance about the conditions in, in Ujiji and Usumbura, we lacked barter material. The hostilities of the people who brought us ab abundant food and cattle could therefore almost be considered as welcome for us, unquote. His report was sent in June 18, 1898 to the governor and then published in January 1899 in the organ of colonial propaganda. And parallel to that, Gravert sent crates with belongings of the Warundi and the Wanya Rwanda to Dar es Salaam in June 1898, crates that were then shipped to Berlin in January 1899 and landed at the museum in February 1899. Other shipments from Rwanda with larger objects, such as you will see some, um, some beautiful drums, arrived in Berlin in 1902 and 1903. 
we might actually never find out whether Gravert took them from the homes of the people he attacked. But beyond your obsession of determining provenance for each and every one of those uh, items, can we actually relate stories of resistance to crimes perpetrated by uh, colonial regimes? When the Wanyarwandans showed the Germans that they were annoyed at the way the colonialists took supplies without giving them anything in return, they resisted only to see their, their homes being burned down by the Germans. And some of these drums, if we can imagine these drums to have been um, hit by people, some of these drums might, might have served to mobilize or communicate, um, to mobilize against colonial rule. They are now lying on shelves in a storeroom. They are mute and await for the opening of storerooms to be reawakened. The other trajectory that we have departs from the museum. So all these museums, <laughs> um, their uh, databases, their storerooms, their archives. And we, we look at those collections and the question is, what can we found there that has been disregarded or even willingly concealed by the museums? Are there objects or subjects who should be returned? And finally, who regulates access to this knowledge and how can we make it more accessible? Oops, sorry. <laughs> we have worked extensively on the context of Togo and Ghana, so German Togoland, and have shared transcriptions of archives to Togolese and Ghanaian colleagues, such as Koko Azamede, Oini Mausetofa, and Waziapo. Here's uh, Dr. Oini Mausetofa, for example, and uh, with our team in, in Cologne. Um, I plan on bringing these compiled archives to Lomé and Accra to discuss whether this material is relevant to the Togolese and Ghanaian scientific communities and also to cultural agents there. And what kind of untold stories of colonial plunder should be excavated? You have many photos, for example. Um, we are also allowed to, uh, to take photos of objects, but not allowed to tell them where the objects are in the, in the storeroom. And here you... You have an example of one, um, one piece of archive where you have uh, maps of uh, German Togoland from, from the time, from 1898. Maps that were drawn by the colonialists that actually plundered um, African communities. Here's another very long, um, 179 pages of, uh, uh, with 1,700 objects that were taken by the officer Gaston Thierry in northern, northern Togo and Ghana. We also work in close collaboration with our colleagues Richard Zogang-Fossi and Sebastian Sprute. Um, this is um, um, a project on Cameroon. They attempt to draw an overview of colonial collections from Cameroon. And one of the several officers under our scrutiny, uh, called Karl Adamitz, um, brought those two figures alongside 240 other items and belongings from the grass fields. And he wrote the following in the, in, in the archive that is attached to those objects. And I quote him, ever since I have been stationed in the Bamenda district, I have come to the following conclusion. Collecting during wars enables one to obtain more complete and unspoiled results than collecting through purchase. In the next few days, the campaign against Munchi, the TIF community, will begin, followed by one in the Basho area. I hope that Captain Glowning and I will be able to send some useful items to the museum in the course of the campaign." Unquote. I could give you several other similar quotes that attest of how colonial plunder took place and how those officers actually talk about that. Um, basically, um, the officers put the blame on communities who either who refused to submit to colonial rule, to colonial law, justified punishing them so, in, their, in their language, and uh, then plundered their belongings and, and took everything with them, um, from artwork, do doorposts, to um, necklaces, to the things that were actually very personal. Um, if you're interested, we can come back to the different forms of those so-called punitive um, missions in the discussion, but I don't want to, to bore you with, uh, with military history. I want to continue with another quote that indirectly attests to the resistance of African communities to the appropriation of their belongings. My colleague Richard sogang and I thank him for that, found this doc document in the archives of the Berlin Ethnological Museum. It was written by the art dealer Umlauf, so Johann Friedrich Gustav Umlauf, 
one of the most prolific sellers of African art and belongings at the time. It was sent as an appendix to his Cameroon collection, and I quote him, when you consider the rich material of idols, masks, carvings, drums, weapons, household utensils, etc., you might be led to believe that such things are easy to obtain. In reality, the situation is quite different. The transport of such large pieces as doorposts, ancestral figures, drums, etc., is quite difficult and extremely expensive. Besides, the Africans are very attached to their things, and especially to old inherited family pieces. In normal circumstances, they can hardly be persuaded to give them away, even less to give away old masks and sacred objects. We even have to bargain for a long time for items of everyday life, and they can only be acquired in exchange for lavish gifts. Only in times of war, or in the case of great expeditions, are conditions more favorable um, with power that can exert a certain pressure." Unquote. Umlauf was an art dealer who profited from the plight of non-European people um, to uh, make profit, um, um, uh, make profit from their uh, from their cultural heritage. And here he openly admits that Africans held on to their belongings and that violence would one was the best modus operandi for getting hold of the most prized objects, such as royal insignia or, or thrones. My experience with museum archives and provenance research tells me that if you if you find needles of agency such as those those quotes of um, Africans hang, hanging on to their cultural heritage, even if you find the, the idea of provenance research itself as a basis for telling those histories is questionable. Uh, first, it is often used to delay the quest for justice, reparation, and and restitution. Um, the, the thing is that one should recognize that colonial regimes were, by their very nature, regi regimes of terror and coercion. And for this reason alone, colonial collections should be open to anyone interested in issuing a restitution claim, regardless of what this research says. Secondly, uh, as Clementine Delis argues, and I quote her, the irony is that this renewed verve of so provenance research goes back to the source, so to what she calls the ethno-colonial museum, in order to recreate missing pieces of information omitted at the time of acquisition, unquote. I agree with her that um, this is a practice that re-legitimizes the ethnographic museum and that we should go away from that. Drawing from Sadia Hartmann, Priya Basil also called, um, also asked for um, other narratives to arise. And this is what Clementine Dolis also writes in her book, The Metabolic Museum. And uh, Basil wrote, and I quote, I propose that forensic dissection unite with unfettered imagination. I see necrography, so the writing of the loss, mixing with artistry to enable what I would call fabulography, a practice of projecting freely, associatively in into the gaps of the past to retrieve in any form, such as song, dance, film, text, drawing, or recipes, to retrieve something of what has been lost. These attempts would create potentiality and other kinds of liveliness around objects, a challenge to the stifling authority of traditional museums. This is something we are currently trying to explore, but I must say that just like ethnography locked up those objects on shelves, shutting them down in stillness, putting them at disposition of the white gaze, in a similar ma manner, the rigidity of access to storerooms today the violence and racism pervading the archives and the dryness of museum discourse and provenance research kind of obstructs any glimpse of creativity. It kind of entraps us in stories of loss, stories of colonial violence at a time when we should have the potential to shape stories of empowerment, of restitution, of reconciliation. In a nutshell, I hope that artists, curators, researchers and activists will all participate in shaping this fabulography, away from a neo-colonial ethnographic anthropological interpretation of those collections of those objects or those belongings. Imagining not only how these objects would be cared for today in Cameroon, Tanzania, Togo, Nigeria, but also perhaps imagining 
what Fela Kuti or uh, Chimananda Ngozi Adichie would write if they could engage with Nigerian collections in German museums, if they had five hours or even a month that were given to them to visit the storerooms and do something with it and write a narrative. I thank you for listening and really look forward to um, the other presentations and the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Legal, for this for this input, um, which was shocking, but really empowering at the same time. I really um, I'm really excited to discuss this further later on. But um, let's first hear our next participant. I would like to welcome Chao Tayana. She is a Kenyan digital heritage specialist and digital humanity scholar. She combines computer science and her lifelong passion for history. She calls herself a headstrong historian. Her work primarily focuses on the application of technology in the preservation, engagement, and dissemination of African heritage and culture. She strong, strongly believes in the potential of digital technologies to create new forms of engagement with African heritage outside dominant colonial and neo-colonial structures. This has and continues to be the guiding principle of her work. So welcome, dear Chayo. She's also the founder of African Digital Heritage, that is an organization that seeks to encourage a more critical and holistic approach to the design of digital heritage solutions. She's also a co-founder of the Museum of British Colonialism, where she leads digital engagement, and she is also a co-founder of the Open Restitution Africa Project. Welcome, Chao Tayana. We can't wait to hear more about your work. Thank you very much, Aisha. Hello, everyone. My name is Chao, and uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Thank you to the team for organizing this and to the my fellow panelists. I must begin by saying I'm feeling slightly under the weather. And so if it appears that I'm low on energy, it is because of that, not because I am not excited to be here. In fact, I'm very, very excited to be here. I will just like to share my my screen um, with the hopes that you can see my presentation. Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. And so when I received the brief to talk about the narratives of the objects, I really have been thinking, one, about my place as a cultural practitioner, Secondly, about my place as a historian and um, someone who sits on the intersections of um, digital worlds and tries to explore them from the perspective of African heritage. Personally, I believe that um, work that I do and the work that my projects and, and, and different forms of art that I create are both a communion with my ancestors in the sense that I do feel that a lot of the work that I do is, is um, led by those who have come before me and the impetus to stick through it against many challenges, against many odds, um, both systemic and, and um, communal, personal, um, is a great part of, of those who have come before me. And I use it as a dialogue to really understand my present, to understand uh, communities uh, at present, societies, and, and kind of our, our structures at large. We always think of technology as, as um, being futuristic. Yeah? So we think about tech, now we're talking about the metaverse, we're talking about artificial intelligence, we're talking about you know, the idea that technology is um, rapidly or even sometimes forcefully advancing us forward. But I also do like to posit that technology is not just about futures. It is also an opportunity, in fact, a great, great opportunity to radically um, shift 
reimagine the story, define African past in particular. I also posit that um, technology as a whole and digital media digitization uh, is a primary form of, of decolonization if um, done right and if the appropriate ethics and um, methodologies are put in place. So I started with a sense of a lot of digital um, discomfort in the sense that the work that we do, the work that I do, in as much as it is about positioning technology as a central form of participating within digital historical spaces, sorry, that there is a discomfort when it comes to technology. And uh, this discomfort really um, mimics the injustices, the inequalities and biases um, that we have in the real world. While at the same time, uh, digital technology is a key path to increasing access to collections. You know, we talk about collections in the hundreds of thousands being put online. Um, we talk about the potential for people and communities um, that have lost their culture to access to, um, to access it on 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 digital platforms. Um, there is still a potential for uh, digital tools to entrench and to further embed the legacies of colonialism, racism, and the erasure of Black history that manifests in the physical world today. And so it is also to say that while well, technology is an answer, it is something that we should approach with caution, while at the same time positioning our voices as African practitioners within the digital space, rightfully so. Some of my earlier projects are um, what has led me to this discussion today. And so while this discussion really is about objects for the past five or let's say five years in Kenya, I have been working uh, and I have been a co-founder of a collective known as the Museum of British Colonialism. We began this project uh, really out of one, a need to understand the kind of colonial legacies uh, that manifest here in Kenya today, uh, the history around it, and really to, to bring open the archives around British colonialism and what took place. In this sense, we are one, positioning ourselves as um, curators, as artists, as thinkers, as people who are affected by this history in a space where one accessing objects is, is um, very difficult. Accessing archives is a whole other story because many of the archival records pertaining to the period of uh, the war and the fight for independence in Kenya are not even in Nairobi, they are held in the UK and so as people who are really struggling against um, this structure that is de designed deliberately not to let us encounter our history, we began to go out into the field, we began to interview people, and we began to use digital technology as a way to combine um, living memory, to combine intangible heritage with archives, with um, archaeological structures, and, and evidence that we find today. One of our primary um, goals with this project has been to map and to visualize detention camps that were set up during the state of emergency. I won't go into it in detail, but I'm happy to share the website um, after this. But I wanted to begin by sharing this because this project as a whole has been one in which um, we have centered participation and active participation in history, whereas we have also been able to reconnect and, and, and re-engage with our families around histories that they have um, and that we have in our homes. Through this project, I was able to find out that my great-grandmother was detained um, in a detention camp for seven years. And here is my grandfather um, sharing his story and also looking at the work that I've been producing around this material. One of the things that I remember when I showed my grandfather the archives and the work that we had found was that he said he had never had a visual image of where his mom had been held. And this goes to show um, that in as much as we can keep history away from people, um, whether it's archives, whether it's objects, that really this effect that it has on people not having even a visual reference of their history, a visual reference of a particular time that is so important in their life, um, can be very destabilizing. 
And so when we talk about objects, I really want to center the, the idea that this work about decolonization, this work about um, restitution is, an, is, a, is work about people. Um, in the ways in which Western kind of um, ideologies, particularly in regards to African people, have paid more respect to objects than um, they have to people, whereas people's humanity is stripped from them. And um, we have a barrage of racial slurs that are constantly used to describe people. The objects that people have created are put on a pedestal and put in basements in temperature controlled rooms if they're lucky or um, behind glass cases. And so I believe that pushing back against this kind of placing of objects and the ways in which colonialism deliberately separated people and objects um, is a big part of the work we're doing today. And a big part of this is encouraging participation and active participation, almost as a form of activism in reclaiming our history. I will talk about uh, one of the projects that I'm doing today that is called Open Restitution Africa. And in this project, we are really centering one, the idea that restitution is not about objects. It is first and foremost about people. It is first and foremost about um, recognizing what this loss has uh, meant, what pain it has caused, but at the same time, what it means to work in this space what it means for the practitioners who have to deal um, with, with um, the loss and the lack of these objects here, and at the same time have to constantly be asked to perform for Western institutions why they are worthy of receiving their objects and why they are worthy of receiving their own cultures. And so we, we took um, the process of restitution as a whole and asked ourselves, um, where's the data on restitution? We can talk about one object from France being returned to Benin, but at the same time, we do not have data on the long history of restitution requests, how many times objects have been requested from a particular museum, who has requested, how many of these requests have been ignored, how many of them have been acknowledged, um, how many things have been returned. And while restitution is very, very prominent in kind of discussions, we are dealing with um, a lack of centralized data, particularly um, data around um, the African perspective on restitution and, and kind of this hampers ways in which we can, we can collaborate with each other. And so we are creating a database that is mapping, among other things, returns, pending requests, best practice, um, highlighting the role of African practitioners and the complexities that they face, um, the emotional labor, the psychological labor, the intellectual labor that is involved in this process, and really our visions for, um, for future and present and, and what this would mean to have um, for Africans to actively um, be part of this space and to be visible. Um, one of the findings that we have and we are soon to publish is around uh, publishing on restitution. We have found that restitution um, has increased by more than 100% on digital spaces and, and kind of discussions on it in academic circles, yet African scholars are being are the least cited in the discussion. And so it is positioned as something that is about Africa, but at the same time, uh, very few Africans are being cited despite the fact that this work has been done. And so this work is as much about um, restoration as it is about um, staking a place um, in this position, in this vast, vast digital world in which so much is happening. But at the same time, it is very easy to to be lost. Um, for me, I think participation is a form of resistance. It is a refusal of the status quo around dominant histories. Uh, it is a way to legitimize sources such as oral history, indigenous knowledge that have been ignored and shunned and disparaged. And in itself, a way to really look at ways of healing, you know, um, what it means for me as a young woman, as a young African woman, to be working in this space um, is really to find myself grappling with very many questions that I may never have the answer for, but at the same time that um, allow me to get a sense of healing for myself in a world that has, um, or in systems that have um, 
tried very hard to to ensure that um, my sense of identity, my sense of place, are are not given to me and are not easily accessible. Uh, what it means to do this work, in as much as we are working in digital spaces, uh, in all our projects, I truly believe it is about centering experience of human beings. How do we humanize this process? How do we talk about the frustrations of, of having to write letters of requests over and over again that go unanswered? How do we talk about um, encountering racist um, material in archives and how that affects not just the research, but the researcher as well? Um, how do we listen to people's experience? Because we are dealing and constantly rummaging through archives that did not even see us as people in the first place. And so if you are relying on these archives as the sole historical um, proof of record, then what does it mean um, to, to produce material that is based on, on solely these archives? How do we measure the impact of this work, which is a question that we have been grappling with for a long time, and how do we replenish and restore for ourselves in as much as we are doing this in service um, for ourselves, our families, and to our communities as well. Uh, I have a line from Saidia Hadman, and, and she says that expanding the limits of the unseen, it is easy to hate the creator of the archive, what is not easy to confront up is to confront our inheritance of this hate for ourselves. And um, participating within this work, looking at objects as they relate to communities, as they relate to spirit, as they relate to indigenous knowledge, um, is a big part of, of listening to, to that which is answered in the archive and in the provenance records that we see today. Uh, how do we create a space for dialogue and language? But really at the end of the day, I believe that it's about freedom, um, a freedom to be angry, to be frustrated. When we speak to African practitioners and, and practitioners of African descent, we often don't even hear the kind of frustrations of dealing with the system, um, the personal toll and the emotional toll it has on people, you know, and how do we talk about it as an equal part of the work? Finally, for me, I, I, I choose um, in many ways to focus on the freedom, the freedom that digital technology brings, uh, the freedom that it has for us to encounter each other across um, countries, across time zones, but really to grapple with difficult questions, particularly around um, the legacies that are so entrenched in our systems today and really force us to, to think in a certain way, which is really not, not the only way. Um, through digitization, through digital discussions, we are creating derivatives of the original object, and we need to ask ourselves critical questions as well. Um, do Western museums have the right to digitize objects that they do not own in the first place? And when they digitize these objects, who owns the copyright for this material? And so this disruption and the digital discomfort is also about really asking hard questions around technology and the ways in which it can enable um, violence to, to continue in many ways. Yes, this is uh, the end of my discussion, which is a quote that I like to say um, that history is hiding everywhere. It's hiding in the archives, it's hiding in the museums, but sometimes it's hiding in front of us as well, um, in people, in buildings, and really doing our best, my best um, to, to ask um, myself how to go beyond the kind of singular agendas and singular narratives that have been a big part of, of, of how I have encountered the world. Thank you very much. I hope I'm, I'm looking at my clock and I hope I'm, I'm still on time. I look forward to having a discussion later. Thank you so much, Chao, for this wonderful presentation. And um, yeah, we, you have ended just in time. So let me not lose more time so we have enough space to discuss this all together. Um, I want to introduce our next participant and I will now switch to the German channel for that. Mm -hmm. 
Ja, also wir ja. sprechen natürlich schon jetzt in der vergangenen Zeit über diesen Kontext. Und We have talked about this context for a long time. And just in order to explain everything, we are talking about collections, material and immaterial objects are currently in uh, European museums, that is to say in Germany as well. Jan Legal has just clearly mentioned that in his presentation. Very often such collections were put together in a context of colonialism and violence and people responsible in museums and collectors therefore have uh, used the structures of European colonialism and have strengthened colonialism because of their interest to acquire and collect objects. This is a topic we are discussing in the context of decolonization and our next participant is very interesting in that light because she works in one of those museums. Stephanie Bach became a curator for global art history focusing on Africa in 2019. She works at the Grassi Museum for Völkerkunde Ethnological Museum. Dresden also had a very important collection and there are many objects that are still in that collection. Stephanie Bach studied art history, uh, non-European art and culture, focusing on Africa, and she has studied at Leipzig University. Today, she joined us to talk about how ethnological museums, the Grassi Museum, to be precise, deals with that context and what the discussion is. They have a program called Reinventing Grassi. It is a program that is in the making, currently being planned at the museum, at the Grassi Museum, and she's going to talk about that. So welcome, Stephanie Bach. Thanks for inviting me and thanks for organizing such an event. I'm very happy to be with you. And I'm very happy to represent my whole team today. And I can also speak on behalf of uh, the partners that we work with, cooperate with. And I hope that you can now see my presentation. It's a pleasure, as I said, to introduce our new program, Reinventing Grassi. Of course, I do have just a short time available to give you an insight next to the Hamburg program and the Stuttgart Museum program. We are the third museum that was uh, chosen by the uh, Cultural Foundation of uh, Germany to receive funding to plan our museum in a new light. We would like to become a network museum, transforming our museum altogether. That is to say, we'd like to give a platform for many different voices. We'd like to work with other actors and visitors in order to take a critical look at our ethnographic, ethnological election and take a closer look in particular at uh, the history of how this uh, collection was acquired. We did our opening event on the 4th of uh, March and here we worked with a network and that focuses on re repatriation and restitution. We also have established a backstage area, but I'm going to talk more about that as I go along. Just to give an insight about our museum, we have two identical floors, a total space of 4,000 square meters that we'd like to rearrange and redesign. One third of the space has already been transformed, has been redesigned. Uh, so our visitors still see some older parts of our exhibition at the same time they see the newly uh, redesigned exhibition areas. And this also shows the development. The old exhibition was hierarchically structured. The new exhibition is going to focus on cultural, political and uh, social connections. Let's start on the first floor. Here you see a wing. I mean, if you've never been to our museum, it's a very complex structure. On the first floor, we have our so-called backstage area. Three rooms were redesigned so that visitors go through the old parts uh, called 
Asian collection, and then they move on to the backstage area. The backstage area looks like that. This is the first uh, room we have redesigned. It was developed based on the idea that we would like to show our visitors what we do at a museum. So what happens next to exhibitions, next to the visible things, there are many different things that uh, we do and they are important. And that is why we have uh, opened a so-called care room where you can learn something about uh, conservation work. The problem is that our mm, storerooms are full. And since we are now dismantling the old permanent exhibition, all the objects need to be inspected, repackaged, because they have been on display for many, many years. And some of the objects are damaged, uh, uh, bleached, their temperature and humidity damages, or some objects are treated with uh, toxic biocides for the purpose of conservation. These are the problems that we are currently faced with. Furthermore, we work together with different communities uh, of origin. On the left-hand side, you see our Marajeshu project, where we take the objects we have from the Kilimanjaro region uh, in order to um, inspect them, catalog them, and work with communities. We have the so-called Room of Remembrance. This room is subdivided into a protected area and a open and public area. It was a room established for the purpose of restitution of museum objects and repatriation of human remains. Here visitors can go to the public area and see an exhibition there on what we have already repatriated and restituted. restituted. So visitors can learn what that means. Restitution becomes ever more important. And so it was important for us to show that to the public so people can develop respect for such practices. Here we have really talked to the communities of origin and we have developed and designed this room together with them on the right hand side uh, on you see the protected area there is a special room reserved for our visitors there is a research room and there is a storage room for objects to be repatriated or restituted next to that we have a semi-official room for rituals for events ceremonies. This can be done by the communities, uh, depending on what they want to have. Do they want to share their encounter with ancestors, with us as museum staff or with the uh, general visitors, or do they want to have a complete private setting? It's up to them to decide. It's a long-term process and we just respond to the demands, requests. And uh, of course, you can also uh, directly contact us for restitution claims. Then we have a prep room. It's our exper experimental room. It's called uh, things that can happen but need not happen. It's a place where we invite guest curators, scholars, artists, who work together with our museum staff on a specific uh, object, a specific issue. The first topic currently is subjects, objects, and things in between. Anna Schiff and Haka Schneider were invited. They deal with the classification of our objects. Uh, let me say that we have a total of 200,000 objects. 45,000 of these come from the African continent. And those two scholars deal with the issue, what is the Eurocentric view on these objects? Uh, what did that mean for them personally? How did they change because of the European attitude? And what can we do? How can we critically uh, revisit our classification systems to include other worldviews? 
Then we move up to the second floor of our museum. Here we have the left wing. It's on the 4th of March, we opened it. The remaining rooms are still closed, but they're going to be reopened step by step. In the first room, we confront our colonial heritage. Jan Legal has already talked about the problematic uh, appropriation acquisition context. Here, we deal with Karl Wollner, our second director. Uh, he started in, two, in 1907 uh, working with collectors and he increased the number of objects fivefold. 120 object, 120,000 objects uh, came to our museum under uh, his leadership. He introduced uh, a categorization system. He developed an inventory system. And of course, uh, their major deficit, because it's a collection that was put together because of colonial context and not much information was lost. And for us, the question is, how can we retrieve that information? How can we get access to the collective knowledge and how can we work with our partners to generate that knowledge? And what could be the future of these objects acquired during that period? The next room is a room for our project Berge Versetzen, Moving Mountains. Um, Para, a, an artist uh, collective, worked with Tanzanian colleagues. This project is an attempt to establish a participatory restitution system. Um, in a nutshell, it's a very complex project. Um, in 1889, Hans Meyer, a geographer, undertook a Kilimanjaro exhibition. So he went to Tanzania. At that time, it was uh, the a part of the Southwest African German colony. Meyer took part of the crater and he uh, christened the peak Kaiser Wilhelm, Emperor William peak. And um, he took elements from that uh, mountain, gave it to the Emperor William. And this peak is now lost. The other half of the, of the stones were given to the son of uh, this collector and he sold it to Austria and uh, it, it is supposed to be re so, uh, resold now. So uh, here we have Tatjana and Amani as our partners who talk about the uh, echo of void that was created because of colonialism. And they also talk about uh, this part, this stone that is missing now. So we try to find out where the remaining stone is. So we would like to re-restitute this stone. We would like to do that uh, when we sell replicates of the Kilimanjaro uh, peak. As you can see, these are replicas, replica stones that we have manufactured. We have uh, mixed loam with part of the stones that were used for the building of our museum. And uh, these uh, stones can be bought by our visitors. We would like to sell 2,000 uh, stones uh, and at the price of 35,000 euros, we would like to rebuy the original stone. Uh, on, in 21, we took the a stone from the Zugspitze, the highest mountain of Germany, and we have uh, put it into our collection, as you can see on the right hand side. Uh, only when the stone will, re will be re-given to the Kilimanjaro, the uh, original stone from the Zugspitze, the German mountain, will be put back in its original place. Then we have the Benin Bronze rooms. In April 21, we have decided or we have signed a declaration according to which the first objects are to be restituted to Nigeria in 2022. We have also decided that until ownership is finally established, 
we are going to work together with uh, the state of Nigeria and um, the royal family of Benin bronzes. We are not going to exhibit the bronzes until restitution issues are clear. First of all, we show here in this room the history of uh, the Benin bronzes, how they were found. There was uh, this exhibition, 1887, and uh, the first bronze statues came to our museum a year later, and they were always on display. So then the last display was removed in July last year, and we now have different interviews on display with Nigerian actors about the past, the present, and the future of these bronze statues. We have also installed a graphic design showing the history of restitution claims, how many times the Nigerian state contacted uh, European states to get their statutes back. And we also have uh, an, in, an artistic installation of a threshold symbolizing the difficulty of restitution. Here we have also the bronze statue displayed as photographs, as portraits. They show that these objects have a, dis a divided life and uh, it also shows that these bronzes uh, le have left a void in their place of origin. The portraits also question the right of, of Western visitors to see the objects. Those statues were taken from their origin and that robbed them, uh, that uh, removed them from their original history. In a Western museum, they were just, um, they were just statutes without a life, without a past and a future. And uh, here we have said it is now necessary to provide accessibility and accessibility they can never have in a in an alien European context, museum context. We have also bought a robot called Ellipse. No matter where you are in the world, you can visit our museum. Of course, you need internet access. We use Ellipse, our robots, in order to talk to our communities of origin. Whenever we have a cooperation project, we uh, use the robots uh, to visit our exhibition. We have also changed our online presence on the right-hand side. You can see how we have changed. One and a half uh, year, uh, weeks ago, we had a partial opening of our new um, spaces, and we have developed the project with our Vietnamese community in Leipzig. And it shows uh, the history of contract workers in East Germany, in GDR. There were many Vietnamese workers in East Germany, and so their life is being portrayed. In September, we are going to open another part of our exhibition. It's going to be the so-called third space that will be accessible free of charge. And here it's a space that we'd like to have as open as possible, a, a room for special events, for a reading room, a room to play. Our workspace on the right, uh, that you see on the right hand side will also be available for uh, NGOs or Leipzig based initiatives. And we are also going to have a pub there. Further openings of our museum are being planned for September and hopefully next year I can invite all of you to come and see our museum yourselves. Thank you very much, Stephanie Bach, for this uh, introduction and your information about the Museum Grassi in Leipzig, what you're doing now and what you're going to do in the future. So we will continue now and English, I English channel. switch to English now. So our last participant for today is Ibrahim Achiam. Ibrahim Achiam is a photographic artist in 
that lives in Senegal, in Dakar. And he is also part of a project uh, our curator is currently having it's called Talking Objects. And he will be having an intervention at the Museum Theodore Monod in Dakar. And we, he will now give us some details about his work. And we are really excited to have Ibrahim Atiam here to give us an not only African perspective, but also um, artistic perspective. So welcome, Ibrahim. Bonsoir à tous et à toutes. Ça fait un grand plaisir de partager ce projet avec vous. Je, je remercie la Fondation Elvis Paul, Isabelle va Vielen herzlichen Dank für die Einladung. Thank you very much for the invitation. Und uh, vielen Dank an die anderen Panelisten. Thank you very much to the other panelists. I will show you a few pho photographies in order to illustrate my talk. I'm talking about uh, remembrance and imagination, my inspiration source. is the African fantasy and I combine it with real other things. And I think that photography allows us and gives us the opportunity to go beyond the limits of archives, the physical and material limits of archives. I think this is particularly interesting and when it comes to the objects, the language of the objects and the restitution. We have, as far as I've understood, a new national ethics that we've developed. This is also very interesting to hear more about it. And there is also a political connection. In order to improve our um, uh, living together, um, unfortunately, the original sound isn't very good, so it's a little bit difficult to interpret. So, as you can see, I work a lot with imaginary narratives. So my grandmother told me many stories. I grew up with the myth of an invisible spirit and based on the, of, through photographic art, I wanted to illustrate that this is why I use these image to tell these narratives, um, a narrative about Makuabam, and in order to decolonize the spirits, we have many traditional narratives that we can use, and we should not forget about the, this traditional knowledge. Unfortunately, the line seems to be interrupted so the speaker can not be heard anymore. The image is frozen and there's no sound at all. Okay, we seem to have technical difficulties here. I don't know. Can you still hear us? Tu, tu nous entends, Ibrahima? Uh, 
it's it seems like Ibrahim Atiyam has just he just went out of the session. We're hoping that he will be coming back in the next minute with a better connection. So maybe in the meantime, we want to improvise a bit. Um, there have already been a question to Chow. So maybe we can just start um, Dear Chow, I don't know if you can hear us right now um, with a question that was directed to you, but I'm not sure if you can hear us, Chow, you could put your Okay, Chow seems to be absent right now. I will switch to the German channel now. Denn es gibt auch eine ganz konkrete Rückfrage an Stefanie. There's also a specific question to Stefanie. Genau. Stefanie Bach. So, here's a question for you. Who selects the scientists or scholars and artists for the prep room and who decides on the topics that are being dealt with there. So in the course of the first residency, this was based on our network. So there were different ideas and the two approached us or through previous projects, this uh, came about and future residencies will also be part of a tender or um, come about due to other cooperation agreements and projects. But as far as I know, Anna Schüke and Franka Schneider, no one else has been appointed yet. So over the next months or years, this will develop further because we have only just started with a project at the beginning of the year in our prep room. Thank you very much. And once again, Again, to all the participants, you can ask questions in the chat function. That's what it's for. And Ibrahim Tiam is back again. So welcome back. Ibrahim, in the meantime, we have just asked a question of a participant to um, Stephanie, but you still have the floor. Unfortunately, we still cannot hear him. On ne peut pas t'entendre. Te connecter avec le son. Ibrahima, we cannot hear you. The microphone might be muted. The microphone is muted. Unfortunately, there is a technical problem. We can hear you, but not really very clearly. Can you hear me now? Yes. Well, I'm Ibrahim Atiam, and I use my images and all tell my photographies in order to um, tell my stories. And I'm interested in imaginary stories. My inspiration or source of inspiration are the African stories, myths, which I combine with real things. I think the these photographies allow us, or photography as such, allow us to go beyond the physical and material limitations of the archives. And I think that Benedict Savard finished, sir. 
have talked about the restitution of the African heritage, and this also meant a new ethic. And this is, I think, the right direction, and this allows us new connections in order to jointly complete our humanity. We have to decolonialize the spirits. We have to use traditional knowledge, religious knowledge, and re-enact this, so to speak. And with my art, I want to work into that direction. I work with imaginary uh, stories, with narratives, with African narratives and stories that I've known since I've been a child. And I think that Africa itself can rediscover itself via these narratives or empower itself. Africa was dispossessed, as we've already heard by Mr. Legal, and um, we need a new bridge. We need to build a new bridge. We also have to take care of this relationship. And I think that through literature, music, photography, film, we can facilitate this process. These are magical tools. And today, the decolonization has not yet been completed. We are not fully independent. And this process of decolonization needs all these tools, all these instruments. So the, these photographies, literature, etc. in order to better maintain it, better take care of it. And we also have to take better care of ourselves and of others. And my work um, is focused on these aspects. Currently, I'm in an artist's residence in the Museum Theodore Monod. And I also work with traditional musical instruments, with a sabat instrument. And this instrument as such is an audio language, so to speak, which is a very important connection for me. And with this instrument, <laughs> I have a connection or rediscovered a connection to traditional dance and this for this dance music was very very important and so a special kind of language emerged it is a language that we also have to take care of and maintain and this is exactly the work that I'm doing right now. I think that all the civilizational treasures need to be um, acknowledged and we also should um, maintain the dialogue, and this is what I want to reflect in my work, the dialogue between us, between the visible and the invisible, between us and the others. And here you can, you can see this dance of which I was speaking, the dance that is supposed to heal here. We have someone who is sick, and is supposed to be healed by this dance. And we should look at the objects in a way so that we understand what they want to tell us. And we also have to share this knowledge. It's also an important deconstruction work and the delocalization work together with a friend, Professor Da, who was at the museum together with the students at the Museum Mono. And 
there was one student who was particularly frightened. He, this fear was linked to the past. We need a deep localization in order to um, confront this fear. So these objects should not only be placed or be shown, placed outside or be shown, but it should be linked to new and connected to new generations. This is why the delocalization is so important in order to bring it back to their initial state. This is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, uh, Ibrahima, for, uh, for la presentation. Thank you very much, Ibrahima, for giving us your perspective. Your perspective as an artist. Claire. Um, thank and you I'm so going to much, speak English now. Ibrahima, thank you so much to all the participants for your input so far. We have about 30 minutes left to get into a discussion. And I would invite all the participants to now put on, to, put on their cameras and join us into discussion first so we can see you. And maybe our technical support can pin Thank you. This is perfect. Thank you so much. And yeah, you are all expert on your topics and on, on the topics the other participants were also talking about. So my first question would be, are there any reactions from you? Anything that you found interesting in what you've heard so far? Maybe ciao. Did you have some highlights or something that, that is still stuck into your mind that you want to bring into this discussion or any questions you have to the other to the other panelists? Not, um, not questions per se, but just I think the work that uh, the different my fellow panelists have talked about really does feed into into each other in, in, I think, in a way that speaks to what it means to practice this in different forms, whether it's in a, like a research perspective, in a museum perspective, um, from a kind of spiritual, very innate uh, perspective as well. I, I particularly uh, resonate with Ibrahima's uh, presentation around the connection of, of uh, spirituality. I think it speaks also to my I, initial uh, presentation around healing and the way in which this works in this in which this work forms a part of um, a healing process and, and encountering these objects not just as a means to an end um, within the restitution process but as a as a way of, of a kind of reparative justice um, for many people in 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 different forms. Uh, I mean, I was struck, but not shocked by some of the quotes that Jan shared around um, the very bold and open recognition um, that uh, colonialists and, 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 and military officers made while taking the objects, you know, because we often hear this counter around um, these objects take, being taken for our own good. And, and to preserve a history that we could not preserve ourselves. And, and you see it in the archive that um, the violence was known from the beginning, you know, and the violence is in the archive. However, whenever we talk about restitution, it somehow falls into a debate on whether it was right or wrong. Um, but we are seeing the archival record um, kind of admit to the guilt and to the, the wrongdoings from the very beginning, you know. So, it's, it's been an interesting discussion. It's, it's been a lot, but um, yeah, thank you very much to my fellow panelists. Thank you so much. Does anyone like to add anything to it before we move on to the questions we have in the Q&A section? Jan, please. Yes, thank you everyone for your presentations. I really loved your... Um, yeah, um, you're quoting Emma Césaire and uh, Les Armes Miraculeuses. I didn't know about that uh, that work and the fact that uh, music, photo, 
poetry or visual arts can be can be weapons and are weapons to uh, against uh, against colonial structures. And I think that these weapons are the ones that should be used now for new new narratives uh, attached to those uh, those collections, those objects, those belongings, those uh, mythological figures, etc. Um, and um, Chao, I wanted to say, um, I am shocked at the fact that the archives, uh, Kenyan archives are not accessible to you uh, because they are in the UK. And um, that's everything we try to do when we have access to some archives. We, we asked um, to what extent can we share those with, um, with uh, people in our networks, not only researchers, but, uh, but also activists and, and people in the cultural sector. And um, the, the thing is we can share the trans, we are allowed to share the, the transcriptions of the archives, but sometimes depending on with, with which museum we are working, we're not allowed to share the, the PDFs or the, the original documents. And I think this is your, your project on, on making this available and, and digitizing objects that uh, museums don't own is, is very important. And it is something that uh, happens very often on under the table, but something that should be systematized. Thank you, Jan. Um, Stephanie, was that a uh, hand raising or no? No? Okay. So thank you so much for, first of all, reacting to each other and for that um, kind of interaction between Jan and Chao just now. Um, there is um, a question to directed to you, Chao. Um, you said that the colonial labor is emotional labor. Um, and even I could hear you mentioning even taking in uh, Jan's research is actually kind of kind of an emotional process and labor. Um, so what experience do you have with f descendants of the former colonizers um, doing this emotional labor? Um, because your centric academic approach is rather coined by logocentrism than by emotions. So what are your experience on, on emotions from Europeans, I guess? Oh, well, that's an... <laughs> It's an interesting question. I think I can only answer it in as far as um, the work I've been invo involved in is concerned. Um, I, I am part of the Talking Objects uh, project that Ibrahima is also involved in in Dakar, but here in Nairobi we have had a intervention, a Nairobi intervention, and in, in, in this way we have been able to have uh, critical discussions uh, within our circles as Kenyan cultural practitioners, but with um, practitioners in Germany as well. And I often find that these conversations happen outside museums, but I'm also not in the museum sector, so I wouldn't know um, how much of the emotional labor is accounted for and documented within the museum space. Um, within my other project around uh, British colonialism, I would say that one way of um, encountering or factoring in this emotional labor um, with um, people um, of European descent has been a kind of direct participation um, in working in the field and encountering this history, but also collaborating across um, networks. And so collaboration has offered a, a level of discussion for these frameworks. But I think also sometimes that um, African practitioners are often put in the position to answer very big questions um, around what should Europe do and, and how should museums in Europe act. But the truth is some of us are just trying to, to figure out um, this history is for ourselves. And, and so um, I might struggle to answer that question on behalf of, of someone who's of European descent, yeah. Thank you so much, Chao, for bringing this up. And it reminds me of our second decolonial dialogue we had. It was Dr. Toni um, Hastrup there from from South Africa. She's a she's a 
fifth generation um, survivor of the genocide in Namibia. And she was saying, so I'm dealing or we are dealing with this in our fifth generation. So I would expect kind of Europeans to, to do the same, to deal with it. And um, this kind of uh, reminded me or just connected back to these big questions, like what should we do? What can we do? Um, I guess um, this could uh, be one answer to it, to just uh, deal with the trauma maybe in a way that um, Africans have been dealing with for centuries and generations. Um, so thank you for bringing this up. And my next question, um, well, you see the chat with me. It's um, directed to, to Dr. Legal, Jan. Um, it's a German question, so I would just switch to the German channel. Wozu werden die Objekte bzw. Kultur... The objects and cultural assets, uh, what are they going to serve for? Some of the kingdoms, some of the villages no longer exist and museology is not so well developed in Africa. So what is going to be done with these objects? Okay. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing this um, um, rightly. Um, for the question, uh, please drop the doctor. Um, I mean... It, 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 it just brings a hierarchy that I don't don't like that much. Um, I, it's not because uh, I've got a PhD that uh, I know more about those objects or those uh, archives than the people that are next to me. Um, so um, if I understand well your, your question, um, if if there's a restitution process and um, this community doesn't exist anymore or has moved because uh, because of the violence or has uh, or is in exile or if this um, um, village has been burned down and has not been reconstructed anymore, um, what should we do with the the objects and uh, and this ties up with the question of of um, some uh, African countries um, having not a, a museum studies. Um, okay. Um, I, first, I, I would say that I'm not the one who would say what, uh, what should happen with those, um, with those objects. Um, and there are many players in the, so in the process of restitution, there are so many players. You have the state, you have also the embassy, say the embassy of Cameroon in Germany, for example, um, the state of Cameroon, you have uh, Les Chefferies, so the, um, the traditional leaders. You also have um, scientists and researchers based in Cameroon, say at the University de Chang or Yaoundé. Uh, all these people have actually uh, something to say about what should happen. Um, to those um, to those objects if they are um, subject to restitution claims. And this is not the museum in, in Europe, or this is not me as a researcher working on those archives that should say what should happen afterwards. Um, and I think that uh, Ibrahima and, and Chao and uh, even uh, Stefanie in your museum, you have Ohini, for example, Ohini Tofa, who works there. Um, they all have something to say about, about those objects, about their past, about their, their present situation and about their futures. And so I, I sorry, I'm just uh, pushing away the, the question because I don't think that I'm the right person to answer that. Mm -hmm. Even that is, a, is an answer that is important, I think that you just gave Jan, but I, I wanna uh, bring in Ibrahima um, to maybe imagine or, um, yeah, answer that question. I think this is a very important question. And I think what is interesting is the idea of having a dialogue, not only a dialogue on an institutional level, not only a dialogue on an academic level. I think we have to go beyond that. We have to go to the villages. We have to talk to the people. 
the people that uh, haven't even studied. And we need to ask them, what do they think about these objects? And this, I think, is the basis uh, on which we can achieve something. We can either work on the ground. Well, of course, it depends on how the people are going to respond to these objects. I think uh, these objects have traveled a long way and their travel isn't over yet. They have to go to even the remotest African village. We have to travel as widely as possible because these objects have something to say and the people have something to say regarding these objects. Thank you very much, Ibrahima. Thank you for this answer. There is another question. Also to you, Ibrahima. You've said that photography transcends the borders of materiality and it has the spiritual element. How is it reflected in photography? How do you capture the invisible in your photographs? I do capture things that are not visible. I capture the stories that people tell me all based on these stories and because of these stories. I do what I do. I get these stories from the people I talk to, the people I travel to see. And then I photograph these invisible stories become visible in the photographs. There are many communities that have never reported about their colonial history. Many things are still pushed under the carpets uh, and they try to sort of unleash these stories. And I think photography is very important, uh, very useful for photographs. And these oral histories can also be complemented, captured in, in the pictures. Thank you. Um, just, and thank you to our participants for, for asking questions. Um, and maybe I can bring in just a general question to sum, to sum this up. Um, um, and I wanna maybe go back to this idea of reinventing Grassi uh, in 23. So maybe in 20 years from now, what do you, th what do you think a future of like ethnological collections could be in general, because there's also this whole narrative of even putting into question um, eth ethnological quest, uh, um, collections and also the space of a, of a museum itself. So if, let's play, let's continue this Im imagination game. And what do you think we will be in the next 20 years? Because what we've seen today is that this whole topic of post-coloniality and decolonization is really at a, a starting point. So what would you expect to happen in 20 years? Maybe uh, you can start, Stephanie. I think the relevance of ethnological collections, that is a question that we are asking ourselves day by day. I myself put myself the question, what is my goal? Which kind of it? What kind of institution I'd like to work in in the future? What do I want to continue? For me personally, it's of course interesting to look at the colonial heritage uh, to rethink it, reprocess it, make another access possible to the collections, to the documents, let other people speak, give a voice to the people for whom the objects are important. We've just talked about the emotional level. Of course, it's very important to mention that to that emotional level. It was already said, we are a wide team. And that's all I can say about it. 
I'd like to have a museum, if the ethnological museum is going to be continued, that other voices will be heard there. That maybe my work will no longer be necessary there. I do not know whether this museum, an ethnological museum, is going to exist in 20 years from now. And uh, of course, restitu restitution never means just the end of the ethnological museum. Maybe it's a starting point for a closer cooperation and other common projects can be initiated. You do not need these objects as such to work together. We see it in the case of the Benin statues. We have very interesting responses that uh, we received. People are happy that they can now see the details of these Benin statues. Uh, the photographic work and the bigger size makes it possible for viewers to see all the details of these small objects that they couldn't see before. So we have to sort of think in a new way. An ethnological museum does not exist just on the basis of objects. Beyond the objects, there is cooperation. And I think this is one of the uh, forms of existence of such a museum. Thank you very much, Chao Tayana. Unfortunately, I had to leave our session a little earlier. And she had just said that she is against a digitization just from a European perspective. And so it would be interesting to hear what she thinks about it. But let's hand over to Jan Legal. What do you think will be the future? I think some museums are uh, already like um, shaping this future. If you look at the Tropen Museum in Amsterdam, uh, directed by Wayne Modest and, and with a team of researchers and and um, museum staff that is um, that is constructing a museum for healing, for mourning. I, I will just quote their mission statements um, with overarching themes like love, mourning, celebration, and conflict to awaken the, our cu curiosity about the enormous cultural diversity that enriches the world. And um, so a museum focused on, on social connections and, and transcultural um, meetings rather than on um on material culture uh, i think this is uh, this is something that is happening and grassi is also part of this uh, this movement um i also think about the future of of african museums uh because uh you see in in cotonou uh, they have uh, welcomed uh, glele gezo and Beyonzin, so the um the um, um, embodiments of those uh, kings of Dahomey, um, but they are in a museum that is run by a, a French foundation. And so um, you ask yourself, okay, what kind of uh, new uh, hierarchies are, are built there? Are there still hierarchies of power over there? Um, what about the museum in Benin City that will be built to, to welcome all the Benin bronzes? Uh, what also, what kind of like um, yeah, what kind of perhaps commodification uh, still takes place and, and who will have access and have the, the money to actually see and engage with those, uh, those objects. Um, but coming back to, the, to European museums, um, I think we're on a good path. And I think all those museums should position, who have colonial collections should position themselves against racism. Um, but this is something that takes time. Also, it takes time in, on an intern, internal basis because there are conflict within museums with different um, positions within the staff. Yeah. Thank you so much. Ibrahima, uh, you are about to start your intervention at the Theodor Musée Théodore Monod and Théodore Monod as a person kind of symbolizes colonialism, I believe. So maybe for that particular museum, how would you, you are now starting a process. Um, you just mentioned the, the, that the Le Voyage n'est pas encore terminé. So we just started this journey. Um, 
where should it lead to? What would be your vision? Je pense que déjà le, le, les nouvelles euh, formes. I think that the new forms of museums that are out there, for example, Theodore Monod invited me as an artist in order to work um, on the collection of the museum. This was the first time that I had such an opportunity. And I think things will change. And I am still focused on delocalization. And with my work, I want the objects to be brought outside, out in the open. I do not, I no longer want them to be confined. We need to create more space for the narratives of the others. I think that we need new narratives for the museums, new archives. And this is the future of the museums in my view, and we are already starting this process in dialogue with the objects, together with the objects, and we also have to work with invited artists, with my foundation and the museum in Senegal. I work in such a partnership, and it's very interesting to work in such a way. We should not only work in the capital, but go to the little villages and find new narratives and create new archives. Thus, we will be able to develop the future museums. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ibrahima, for, for, for the closing words. Actually, I don't think we have anything uh, to add um, to what you just said. I think all the participants, um, as well as our uh, viewers here to to have been staying with us, staying focused, staying concentrated in our session. And um, my last step is saying goodbye and pass on the word to the curator, one of the curators, Dr. Marit Kupka, that will kind of summarize our conversation. And thank you, everyone. And I really hope to, to see uh, you again, to work with you again. And it's been amazing. Bye bye. Yeah, ich habe jetzt die well, um, große I have the great challenge, the great task to summarize today's event and to conclude it and also to provide a forecast and outlook. I would like to thank all of you. It was very dense, very rich in terms of the discussion and the, uh, the aspects of the fourth. Uh, issue of the decolonial dialogues is entitled narratives of objects here the objects are in quotation marks because what we talked about is much more complex than could be captured in the term object the starting point of all our reflections and research are the objects that became colonial looted property and are now in the collections of european museums Quotation marks also because these so-called objects were first violently made into such their cultural, spiritual and religious identities, meanings and functions were mostly quite different in the places, in the communities from which they were looted, motivated by colonial aspirations and the urge to explore the supposed other. Until now, Objectification and subjugation of the other is symbolically enacted in European museums. It is a lengthy process to understand context alienating forms of presentation as such, to deconstruct them and to supplement or even replace them with an appropriate relational ethic. But what should this be like in the first place? Stefanie Bach curator of global art history at the Grassi Museum, Volker Kühn in Leipzig spoke today about the ongoing future program, Reinventing Grassi. By 2023, there is to be a far-reaching transformation of the museum. 
The house wants to become a network museum. Critical perspectives are to be cast on the ethnological collections and the acquisition and exhibition histories are to be brought into closer focus. In Germany, the Mark Museum am Rotenbaum, Kulturen und Künste der Welt in Hamburg, the Rautenstrauch Jüst Museum in Cologne and the Linden Museum in Stuttgart are undergoing similar processes. Ciao Tayana, a historian and expert on digital heritage and founder of Open Restitution Africa, spoke about her project African Digital Heritage. It is about the use of digital technologies in dealing with African cultural heritage. What can a new culture of cooperation look like? It is not only about the shaping of future and the rights of images, but also a reinvention, new definition of African past, as, for example, in the new Museum of British Colonialism. So what kind of role does healing play in this context? Jan Legal, scientific um, staff, at the TU Berlin and part of the restitution of knowledge artifacts as um, archives in the post-colonial museum focuses on acquisition histories. It is not so much about the reconstruction of a so-called object biography, but much further beyond that, namely about the question of how research in museum archives can contribute to a better understanding of the history of colonial violence but also of anti-colonial resistance. What can be learned from these resistances today? How can the gaps in knowledge be filled? Through fabulography, perhaps, a practice of free associative projection into the gaps of the past to recover in some form, song, dance, film, text, drawing, recipe, something of what has been lost. These attempts would create potentials, other kinds of aliveness around the objects, a challenge to the stifling authority of traditional museums that have too long promulgated their own myths and denied other narratives. And Sadie Hartman has been quoted um, several times today. So we are in the midst of a process of change that is not new but finds its origins in the first resistance movements against colonial violence. This resistance is kept alive by new generations of researchers, scholars, artists, and activists. Ibrahima Tiam, artist and photographer from Dakar, is currently a resident at the Musée Théodore Monod in Dakar. In the framework of the project, Talking Objects Lab, which I am responsible for together with Isabel Rabe and Malik Ndiaye, the director of the museum, among others, he enters into a dialogue with the objects of the museum's collection, Revisiter les objets. Ibrahim Tiam is fascinated by the language of rhythm and the sound of vibrating objects, by sound as a mediator between the visible and the invisible. The photographs created during the residency will be shown as projections, during the lecture performance at the Pédagothèque of the Musée Théodore Monod on May 26, 2022. At Talking Objects, we ask ourselves, what would a future look like in which the objects would no longer be claimed, neither by Europe nor in Africa, because their meaning, their spiritual energy, their heritage, or whatever is associated with them, could be made accessible in other ways? Is cultural heritage really tied to objects? Yes and no. We are interested in the question of whether what is essential in cultural spaces does not actually take place in the in-between, between things, so-called objects and people, and between people and people. Ultimately, the object is a vehicle, a mediator. The space becomes a contact zone. The decolonial dialogues Will also contribute to this with the upcoming event on June the 21st on the topic of decolonial memories in the GDR with Naita Hishono, Peggy Piche, Katharina Wada and Hans-Joachim Döring. I would like to cordially invite you to this event and thank you very much for your participation. Until then, ciao and see you on June the 21st, 26th.